Hello everyone, welcome. It's sermon prep time. I'm so glad that you've joined me for this preparation for Sunday. And this Sunday is a bit different. It's not the 18th Sunday, as you might have thought. Remember, last Sunday was the 17th Sunday of Ordinary Time, year A. It's not the 18th Sunday because it's the 6th of August. That's the Feast of the Transfiguration of the Lord. And so because it is a Feast of the Lord, we will celebrate it. It takes precedence over the Sunday, Ordinary Sunday. Um, which is great. It's nice to celebrate uh, this feast. It's an important feast for us because it speaks to the transformation that happens because of God. Um, Jesus was profoundly transformed in the presence of Peter, James and John and, of course, Moses and Elijah. And as you know, I spoke about this last Sunday, actually. We, we're wanting God to transform us, to transform our world. And so if we look at this feast day that really highlights the transformation, the profound transformation in Jesus, we can see that that's for us too. Okay? So let's have a look at the readings for this transfiguration feast the first is taken from the prophet Daniel. And for those doing RCIA, I spoke last week about the prophets in the Old Testament. Daniel is a major prophet. Um, and so we read from the seventh chapter of Daniel, verses 9 and 10, and then verses 13 and 14. The psalm very clearly links to that uh, reading because it has as its response the Lord is King the Most High above all the earth so Psalm 97 the second reading is taken from St. Peter's second letter chapter 1 verses 16 to 19 and then our gospel is from St. Matthew's Gospel, because we are in year A, chapter 17, verses 1 to 9. Let's look at the Gospel, which tells the story of the transfiguration of Jesus on Mount Tabor. And that story, with a few differences, is told in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, it's, it's really important that we consider where this story is situated in Matthew's Gospel. It's the beginning of chapter 17. If we go to chapter 16 and we go to verse 21, we have there the first story prediction of the crucifixion of Jesus, of the passion of Jesus. What's the context in chapter 16 of Matthew's Gospel? It's the famous uh, profession of faith of St. Peter. They're at Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? Who do the people say that I am? And they give all sorts of ideas. And it's Peter who says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Hmm? And after that, Jesus tells them that they going to, he's going to suffer. And Peter says, no, 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 you're not going to suffer. And Jesus says, well, get behind me, Satan. And so... The transfiguration happens, and we're told at the beginning of uh, chapter 17, after six days. So six days after the Caesarea Philippi event, Jesus is transfigured. So there is a real link, and, and Matthew doesn't often do this, but there is a link between these two events, 
the prediction of the passion, suffering and death of Jesus, and his being revealed in glory. So the glory is part of the passion story. Jesus is glorified because of what is going to happen. He is radically, profoundly transformed in the presence of the apostles because of preparing them, linking them, preparing Jesus for his crucifixion. Um, and, and, that, and that's really important. I'd like us to think about that and reflect on that. Transformation through and linked to suffering and hurt and pain. Okay, just an interesting aside for us. Um, it says in our gospel that Jesus was led up. Uh, he led his disciples, these three, Peter, James and John, up a high mountain. There's been m much debate over many, many centuries about which mountain this is. Uh, some people say that if they were in Caesarea Philippi, they were very far up north, uh, all by the Syrian-Lebanese border, and um, the, the high mountain there is Mount Hermon. Um, I was fortunate to go up and see Mount Hermon uh, and Caesarea Philippi when I was in the Holy Land recently, and it really is a high mountain. It's got snow on the top uh, when we were there in, in summer, so it is a high mountain. So some people think he was that was the mountain on which he was transfigured. Mount Tabor in Galilee that rises out of the Jezreel Valley um, is traditionally, it has become traditionally the site of the transfiguration. I visited there too. Very clear high mountain, not as high as Mount Hermon, um, but it stands out over this valley. Uh, so some say he was transfigured there because six days he could have walked from Caesarea Philippi in the north down to Galilee, uh, close to his home of Nazareth um, in the six days and been transfigured there. Um, so, yeah, there's a debate which mountain. But the idea of a mountain takes us back to Moses, doesn't it? And Moses now appears on the mountain with Jesus. Um, the Moses and the mountain, Mount Sinai, receiving the Ten Commandments, remember? Um, very often in the Old Testament times, mountain was associated with the presence of God. People would go up the mountain to meet God. And so here, the uh, apostles with Jesus meet God. They hear God speaking to them. Moses and Elijah, traditionally believed to be symbols, representations um, of the law. Moses gave the law and Elijah, an early prophet. So the law and the prophets. And remember what Jesus had said. I came not to, to um, destroy the, uh, the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Okay, so by him appearing and being transformed and the Father speaking to them in the presence of the law and the prophet seems to really illustrate that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Peter's reaction is interesting, isn't it? Um, he obviously was afraid. Well, of course, wouldn't you be afraid too? Yeah. Um, and so he, he wants to build booths, our translation says. What is a booth? Like a tent. Eh? Um, he wants to build a tent for Jesus and Elijah and Moses. And he sort of says, us. Is he including himself and James and John? Does he also want to stay there? I, I suppose he does. Um, why does he want to do that? <clears throat> why is that what he thinks to do? Maybe he doesn't want Jesus to go back down the mountain. Maybe he doesn't want Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, to face death and crucifixion, suffering 
in Jerusalem, because that's what's happening, isn't it? Um, the first prediction, transfiguration, they're on their way to, to that end. Maybe he didn't want Jesus to suffer. Let's just stay here. But an interesting reaction of Peter to this, um, this event. Um, maybe we should think, what would our reaction be? So, a, a, a profound experience. And that's what happens to Jesus. It would have been a profound experience for him. He is profoundly changed and transformed. And in fact, the word transfiguration means profound change. And you know, we find that word also used by St. Paul when he's writing to the Corinthians, his second uh, letter to the Corinthians, uh, chapter 3, verse 18. He uses the same word, transfiguration, uh, profound change. And he's referring to our profound transformation change um, into the image of the risen Jesus. Same word. That what the profound transformation that happened to Jesus on the mountain is, St. Paul says, the same profound transformation that happens to us when we are made and renewed into the image of Jesus. Very interesting, isn't it? So, what happened to Jesus up there, his profound transformation, is, is what happens to us when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, when we are baptized into Jesus. And that's really, really important for us. This feast day is about our transformation as well. And so, it reminds us of what I've said over and over again, that in this parish we're concerned about the transformation of our world and of our lives. Renewal, yes, but we want more than renewal, don't we? We want transformation, transfiguration. Our faith should significantly change us so as to be in the image and likeness of the risen Lord. Very, very interesting and very, very profound. And in fact, in Eastern Christianity, the Feast of the Transfiguration is really, really, really important. Because of that, they recognize that Jesus came for that. So Christmas and Easter are important. Yes, he came and he suffered and died for us so that we could be transformed. And so for them, the Feast of the Transfiguration, really, really important. Okay, I've said quite a lot about that. If we look at the first reading from the prophet Daniel, it is a vision of the heavenly court, isn't it? Um, and it, uh, the image imagery used is, is a bit scary. We have this idea of fire, of tongues of fire, and a um, uh, person of great age. And it, it's sort of a bit wild, isn't it? But it's meant to convey this idea of the heavenly court, the power and majesty of God, as well as divine judgment. And so when we look at this reading, we have a sense of the magnificence and the power, the wonder of God. We also see here the, the um, reference to, for us, Jesus. Um, and he speaks about this Son of Man that comes. Eh? Um, and that's a messianic uh, title for Jesus. Um, and so there is a clear link for us between God and Jesus. That salvation is also part of this vision. That Jesus, the Son of Man, is to come and is to bring salvation. And that's what transformation is about. Our transformation is about salvation. This powerful God sends his son, the son of man, with power, with judgment, divine judgment, um, for our transformation, for our salvation. 
Okay, it's a really powerful vision in the seventh chapter of uh, the prophet Daniel. And as I said at the beginning, this Psalm 97 and the response really emphasizes the magnificence, the power, the uh, judgment uh, of, of God. The Lord is King, the Most High above all the earth. Clouds and darkness surround Him. Justice and right are the foundations of His throne. So it emphasizes this vision of Daniel. Okay. Then the second reading is from St. Peter's second letter. In this extract, we have a real sense that the author has taken pains to uh, authenticate this account. We are eyewitnesses to this. I saw this. Oof, it's a bit difficult to say that. Uh, if this is Peter, St. Peter, the apostle, it's, um, uh, he's writing this a long time after the event. Um, it most probably is not St. Peter who wrote this, but maybe a disciple of St. Peter. Um, and he's trying to emphasize, and over and over again you get that sense, that uh, he, this is a true account, uh, and you can trust him, and this was his, what he saw. Um, but most probably not what what he saw. Again, this idea of transformation, transfiguration, explaining what the transfiguration is. Um, but it's a pivotal moment for this witness to the transfiguration. Um, he recognizes the divine glory of God. And that takes us back to uh, the, the first reading where Daniel has described this glory of God. And now St. Peter makes sure that we understand that what he saw, St. Peter saw, is the divine glory of God. And, and their experience of this transfiguration, this profound transformation, causes them, gives them the strength and the courage to go out. That's why he's writing this. That's why he does this ministry, because of that experience. He has been profoundly changed by witnessing Jesus' transfiguration. And he wants others to be profoundly changed too. We get a real sense at, at the close, the last verse there. You will do well to pay attention to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place. So this transfiguration uh, and what it's done to the witnesses and the author means that they have become a light to the world. Uh, and when we accept Jesus, we are profoundly transfigured, transformed, and we become a light in our world. And so this moment should help us to be witnesses in the world, to keep speaking this prophetic message of Jesus, the prophetic truth of who Jesus is. Um, and, and we must hold on to that truth. We must hold on to that light and allow that to transform us too. So, the transfiguration clearly, for me, and I think for most, clearly speaks to us about transformation. Transformed by the power, the glory, the wonder uh, of, of our God. Um, and we need to be witnesses to that so that others can be transformed. A little bit longer today because uh, it's a special feast. So I hope you will uh, join us. I hope you will be with us to celebrate this feast. Um, uh, we look forward to having you with us. Take care of yourselves. God bless everyone. Bye-bye.